Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we can now start the first session of the conference. Let's welcome Mrs. Ashpreet Kaur from the USA, who is going to moderate this session. Ashpreet has a master's degree in environmental science, and she's now pursuing her PhD in interdisciplinary ecology at the University of Florida. Ashpreet, welcome, and thank you for being part of this conference. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mani. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Ashpreet Kaur, and welcome to the today's first online session. This session includes five full presentations and two poster presentations. There will be a Q&A session after the poster session, where a few questions will be selected from the chat. Okay, I was sensing a little bit disturbance, but I hope everybody is muted now. Thank you. Um, so you can submit your questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the question interfa interface you see on the screen. And please mention your name and the name of the presenter you would like to forward your question to. Now um, we can start with the first presentation and I would like to welcome our first presenter, Cherlyn Agoja from Philippines, whose presentation title is Plus Fault Utilization of Plastic Wastes as a Binder in Polymer Modified Bitumen for Flexible Payments. Cherlyn Agoja is an undergraduate student of civil engineering at the University of Batangas. Cherlyn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ashpreet. So, hi, my, my name is Cherlyn Agoho, the presenter of this research, which is plus fault utilization of plastic waste as binder in polymer modified bitumen. I'm sorry. I think it, for a flexible pavement with the help of our professor and guidance, we, with the help of our professor and guidance of Injury Siddhartha B. Valley. For our introduction, traditional asphalt or conventional asphalt can easily be broken or damaged in the repair of it one of the problems of construction industry. Different types of plastic waste of one of the most problem in the Philippines, and the researchers conducted a study that will help in elimination of plastic waste. This study will have a major impact on the roadways here in the Philippines for it to be more durable and more stable than the traditional asphalt route Moreover, the government's burden to plastic can be lessened because the said research will be beneficial to the environment on which the growth of plants and trees cannot be lessened because of the plastic in the soil that are blocking the absorption of mineral, water, and nutrients. And, and for our the objective of this study is to determine the compressive strength of the asphalt when mixed with different types of plastic and to determine which type of plastic is to be better to be mixed on asphalt. For our methodology, the first step we got, we gathered all the materials. Bitumen must melt in a constant heat. The 5.25 ml for 10% of the certain plastic was melt. Aggregates boiled with the five minute, within five minutes. Pour the 5.25 ml of plastic into the heated aggregates. Mix it until the additives plastic combine to aggregates. For the 53 ml bitumen to the combination of aggregates and additive plastic. After mixing, pour now into the 2 inches height and 4 inches diameter of PVC. Then repeat the process. It shows on that slide some pictures of our plus part samples. Here's the presentation analysis and interpretation of the data. For table one, we collected the data of the traditional asphalt sample, which the compressive strength test result was 1,151.44 megapascal on where we compared this, the four plus fault sample we made on the conventional asphalt. And for the table two, this is the result of the, of the PET plus fault sample in 20%, 15%, and 10% of plus fault which is 289.26 megapascal, 863.58 megapascal, 578.51 megapascal. And for our HDPE plus fault sample, this is the compressive strength test result 
for for each person is 867.77 megapascal 863.58 megapascal and for our ldpe plus pulse sample the gathered data for LDPE plus pulse sample was presented. It shows the 20%, 15% of LDPE mixture has load of 10 kN, while the 10% of LDPE mixture has 7.5 kN. And the compressive stresses are 1,151.44 MPa, 1,157.32 MPa, and 863.58 MPa. And lastly, for the, and lastly, is for the PP plus pulse sample and it shows the compressive strength test which is 289.26, 287.86 megapascal and 146.28 megapascal. Those table presented was compared to the strength of traditional asphalt and was concluded among all the plus pulse, the asphalt with 10% of PP plastic is more efficient than the other having the strength of 1446.28 megapascal and the ex and exceed the strength of traditional asphalt having only 1151.44 megapascal and the researchers also found out that LDPE plastic can be also alternative mixture for traditional asphalt since the strength are same but LDP are more economical so that's it thank you and have a day have a day Steve. Thank you, Cherylyn, for your insightful presentation. Continuing our session now, you will be listening to a presentation by Sundram Ramanathan from India, whose presentation title is Evolved Gas Analysis of Printed Circuited Boards and Their Effects on the Environment During Informal Recycling. Sundaram is energy and environmental engineer and she is deputy program manager at the Center of Science and Environment, New Delhi. Sundaram, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ashprit, and thank you, uh, ISWA, for giving us this opportunity. So uh, uh, most of us know what is printed circuit board. It's a green color board, which uh, you have on your cell phones and on your systems, computer systems, which is like the key element, which is helping you to, you know, um, uh, use your systems. And that's the key or the heart organ of the electronic devices. So here we're going to see what is happening to this particular uh, um, uh, item after the life of the computer or after the life of your telephones or uh, so, how is it being recycled? That's the topic. Uh, I um, suppose um, uh, the presentation has been changed. Can I uh, upload it, uh, Ms. Kaur? Ms. Um, sure, go ahead and use the upload button to upload it. Right. Um, I guess there, um, okay. there might be, were you able to do it? Yeah, I, I'm able to do it. I'm sorry about this. Right. Okay. Um, sorry. Yeah. So, uh, right now, um, we are generating about, uh, 2 million tons of this e-waste here. Uh, we're ranking the fifth after uh, China, Japan, United States, China, Japan, and Germany. And uh, this is set to increase further. Like globally, if you see, uh, we are generating about 50 million tons of e-waste today. And uh, we are projected like in another uh, 10 years or so, it will be 75. And by 2050, it's going to be 150, like three times of what we are going to use now. And uh, if you see what's happening to this waste, uh, most of it is right now uh, is not formally treated, meaning uh, I am generating the waste, I just dump it in the landfill and neither the person who is actually manufacturing these computer systems or telephones uh, are, are worried about, uh, you know, recycling it. It's just dumped into the landfills and what's happening at the landfill, it's not just going into the landfill and lying still there. It, it's taken for uh, recycling right now in a very crude manner. 
it's it's uh, because it's a material from which you can extract different resources so people want to uh, recycle want to extract the metals out of it and sell it out so it's it's some form of an informal recycling that's happening so it's it's all up happening near urban uh, areas so i'm just giving you an example of moradabad moradabad is a town near delhi and uh, once it used to be a biggest exporter of brassware uh, the, these these items the brass items so they are experts in metallurgy and you know handling metals now uh, because of recession and uh, now that they can't really um, make make a business with the, uh, with these metals they have switched to recycling these e waste and uh, also to say, tell you uh, most of this e waste when we say it can be the plastics and other things but 75% of uh, the waste e waste when we call it it's printed circuit board now uh, these printed circuit boards are collected from delhi from uh, loaded through trucks taken to moradabad and then the families do it and it's it's uh, basically dismantled it's burned you know when you burn the metal doesn't burn it it just uh, stays up as residue and then you grind it you wash it you do acid recovery and and you take out the metal from the uh, printed circuit boards and you sell them so you can see the images of people sitting out there they are they are kind of dismantling it using gases uh, they will burn it some people who segregate the the micro electronic components on the uh, printed circuit board it's being uh, burnt and the, uh, it's it's getting washed and then you can see acid recovery and and equipments with them to grind it now what we wanted to investigate was so this is happening this is the kind of informal recycling which is happening on the ground so what is the environmental impact that is what we wanted to investigate and when we did this uh, we first wanted to check what is the kind of calorific value of that uh, particular the printed circuit board which we are burning we uh, used bomb calorimeter and we found that the, uh, the 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 circuit boards had calorific value equivalent to that of a coal okay it it was something around 3300 kilocal per kg and the carbon hydrogen nitrogen sulfur contents were as much as what was it for coal and uh, apart from this we also did a, a thermogravimetric analysis this analysis basically gives you at every particular time okay at every particular time and temperature when i increase the temperature how does the weight of the um, of that particular printed circuit board which i'm subjecting to heat uh, reacting and what is the kind of um, uh, uh, the gases what is the kind of wavelength it's corresponding to that's the study and uh, we we did this and what we did the variation was in one we took all the components together we just grinded the raw print circuit board and we subjected it to a tga ftir ftir coupled uh, analysis and in another one we just uh, took out all the uh, electronic items away and we just took the plastic board and then we grinded it and we subjected it to this analysis and what we found was this one the absorption absorption uh, values were very high it was up to 8 uh, which which indicates that you know there are multiple compounds which are getting released while uh, when we uh, just burnt the uh, the printed circuit board alone what we found was only co2 peaks which was uh, coming up and it was not really uh, crossing even one and uh, we also did a mass spectroscopy analysis of these uh, grinded uh, samples and uh, what we could find was uh, half of the like we did it for the waste also we did it for the ash also after getting you know after burning it so when we did it for the waste uh, and the ash it it's more or less like you know the uh, the non conducting portion or the insulating material of the board coming up to be half of the literally 56 50 60% of the entire composition is just that silicon oxide and the conducting elements uh, like aluminum iron and other things turning out to be the next half portion and uh, uh, you know the, um, you can really extract this but the silicon oxide is right now not extracted by the people uh, in the informal sector and uh, if you if you kind of accumulate it Uh, it's it's it can increase your risk of uh, uh, tuberculosis and other lung uh, impairments and the second uh, uh, very alarming uh, uh, finding for us was it had heavy metals 
Now, when we grinded the PCB sample and when we subjected to it, we found tellurium very high. It was 1,600 times more than what it is allowed in a, you know, a normal soil. So that, uh, that much high was the uh, tellurium which we found in a PCB grinded sample. And lead was also high. Uh, tellur uh, tellurium can uh, get you to kidney failures. Like if you're just constantly near it, it gets into you. Yes, it can uh, damage your kidneys. Lead can damage your, you know, uh, brain. Total chromium, which can again cause you lung uh, lung ailments. Copper, again, kidney damage. Tin, thallium, selenium, beryllium, or uh, were all these heavy metals which we found. And in the ash, we found it uh, in lacs like exceeding above lakhs of what is the safe limit. So uh, this is just to give you a picture of what the heavy metals could mean. So e-waste right now, if you go to a landfill, you can just see just 2% of the uh, landfills uh, to be with some printed circuit boards. But uh, the hazardous material which is coming through the landfill is coming through these printed circuit boards. So uh, as way forward, what we suggest is uh, there are a lot of urban uh, mining spots which are emerging right now informally for recycling these printed circuit boards. And so uh, there should be more detailed studies to investigate if there is any bioaccumulation of these heavy metals getting into the environment. Uh, there is a necessity to sensitize the informal workers out there on the toxicity of these, um, you know, improper recycling practices. A more formal uh, recycling and uh, uh, occupational method should be explained to them. And uh, Sorry to cut off. Uh, we have a minute left. Okay. So uh, we need to bring in some kind of a printed circuit board, uh, circular economy concept. And maybe we need to ban a certain portion of, you know, how many, how much of newly mined material you can use for this printed circuit box. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, now we will be moving to the third presentation. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, you will be listening to a presentation by Elham Kigobadi from Iran whose presentation title is Economic Feasible Feasibility Study of Implementation of Underground Solid Wastes Collection System in Developing Countries, Case Study of Shaharut City, Iran. Elham is a student at the Department of Environmental Health Engineering School of Public Health at Shaharut University of Medical Sciences. Elham, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I want you to show my slide. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Elham Kekobadi. I'm an environmental health engineer. I'm delighted to be here to talk about my recent study. The title is Designing a Technical Economic Feasibility Study for Implementation of Underground Based Collection Bins in Developing Countries. Our case study is Shrubby City. The waste collection is one of the most important and costly steps of waste management. More than 75 to 80 percent of waste management costs are related to this part, and one of the uh, components of making high solid waste collection system is collection bins. These bins have uh, many challenges, including the overflow caused by the few number of the bins, uh, or the bins are incom uh, incompatible uh, with the urban design, or they can spread out bacteria and different kinds of viruses. In recent years, the underground solid waste collection has been proposed to respond to the problem of the above ground. In this method, the bins located under the ground are larger than above ground uh, bins, and they, uh, the bins uh, will elim eliminate most of the problems caused by the above ground ones. 
There are two types of underground uh, system. One of them is automated vacuum collection, and the other one is a standalone. In number uh, one, you can see a standalone beam system. Only the beams uh, are placed under the ground. Uh, in number two, you can see other system. All facilities are placed under the ground except the receiving hole. Our study location is 22 Batman Street of Shahrukh City. Okay, you can see the picture. Uh, Shahrukh City has a population of about 140,000 people located at the eastern north of Iran, and the uh, weather is a kind of a uh, cold desert one. Except our main goal, we have to specific goals. Uh, determining the technical and financial requirement to design a set of an underground with beams for household space in Shahul and uh, the other one is comparison of the technical and financial requirements between underground and above ground space space. And this is first or second study in Iran regarding to uh, underground base beams and you're looking for answer this question. What are the technical requirements for set, uh, setting up an underground base collection system? How many beams uh, is needed? How much does it cost? And the other questions. Uh, we've done uh, some following activities for this study. At first, we collect the information about the location of the current uh, beams from the municipality, designing an underground base collection beam, and determining to requirement, determining the cost of implementing the underground base collection beams. Uh, each of these items consists of different parts you can see in the slide. A technical comparison of the above ground with underground base beams, economic comparison of the above ground and underground. It's a, con uh, it's a kind of comparison between above ground and underground. We also analyze the current situation. There are 26 beams on the northern side and 21 beams on the southern side with different capacity. The depth of undersurface urban installation uh, are as follow water, gas, and wastewater. Solid waste per capita per day is 803 gram, and the mixed waste base density is 245 kilogram per cubic meter. Uh, you can see the location of current above ground in, in the study area. Uh, and our system has complicated requirements, so we designed a standalone system for the case of study shopping city. Uh, in order to properly cover the above ground and underground uh, base beams, we at first we should specify the coverage required number of the above ground and underground beams for the study area. Because uh, they are, they were not match in size and uh, the number. Uh, after the uh, re after the redesign, uh, according to the calculation, uh, thirty one beams are needed in the study area with different capacity. And after designing the underground beams, uh, according to calculation, fifty underground beams with the capacity of three thousand liters are needed in the study. Area. Um, each system has two categories of cost, including investment cost, cost of purchasing the beams, uh, collection truck, and installing the beams, also operation cost, which consists of uh, cost of workforce, repairing the beams, and fixing the, uh, fixing the truck. And the total investment cost of the above ground with, uh, beams is about $81,164 and the end total operation cost of the above ground base beams for a 10 years period uh, of operation is totally about $163,156 uh, and the cost of the total investment cost of underground base beams is about eighty. Thousand three hundred fourteen dollars, and the annual um, the total operation cost of the underground base beam for a ten years period is uh, one hundred fifty one thousand five hundred seventy six dollars. 
So according to the result for the above round width, since the study area needs 50 beams uh, with a capacity of 450 liters, 8 beams with the capacity of 500 uh, liters, and 8 beams with the capacity of 600 uh, For the above round width, uh, sorry, for the underground width uh, beams, uh, the study area needs 50 beams with a capacity of 3,000 liters. Uh, in number two, there is a comparison between the cost of two systems. So, according to the cost analysis, both the investment and operation cost of the underground base beams would be lower than the above ground one in the 10 years operation period. So, implementation of the underground base beams in 22 Bahman Street of Traffic City is technically and economically recommended. Uh, at the end, I'd like to thank the International Solid Based Association for this opportunity. Also, my professor, Dr. Ayekbar, regarding for his perfect. And thanks for your attention. Thank you, um, Alham, for your presentation. And now I would like to welcome Satya Prabhakaran um, for the presentation. This will be our last presentation of the full session and please be reminded that after this presentation we will have the poster presentation session followed by a brief Q&A session. So let's welcome Satya Prabhakar from India whose presentation title is Harmogravimetric Kinetic Study of Textile Lime Sludge and Cement Raw Meal for Co-Processing in Cement Kilns. Satya is PhD in civil engineering, obtained at the National Institute of Technology, Tiruchipalli. Satya, please, the floor is yours. Satya, you're on mute. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to discuss using uh, te textile sludge as an alternative raw material for cement manufacturing. Before we be begin the topic, I want you to pay attention to the nomenclature to understand the slides better. The cement production requires limestone and fossil fuel. In, in, in India, the cement production rate right now is 300 million tons per annum, and it is going to double into 600 million tons uh, by 2020, 2025. And uh, to meet this demand, uh, we, there is no way on earth we can mine these resources and meet this demand. So we have to incorporate circular economic concepts to develop sustainability. And uh, uh, co-processing is, uh, is the right way to uh, do, do to find the sustainable way to uh, achieve the circular economy in uh, cement sector. As Dr. Arne pointed out, the construction sector is uh, consuming 40% of the resources and uh, it is uh, one by three uh, of the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so it is very important that we use some circular economic concepts so that uh, the bad planning and human error is the reason we are faced with uh, climate change and global warming. So we need to cut back the linear chain and move to the circular economy. So here in figure one, you can see A, B, C. In A indicates lime sludge, B is biological sludge and C is salt sludge. In case of biological sludge, the sulfur content is very high and C, salt sludge is, uh, is chlorine content is very high. As you know, the sulfur and chlorine content is highly corrosive and it's, it can cause uh, scale formation in the cement cleans. Therefore, it, it is not recommended uh, to uh, use this uh, textile sludge uh, in cement cleans without depollution. But in case of lime sludge, it is an uh, excellent alternative raw material for cement manufacturing. Therefore, the lime sludge was collected from Tirupur, uh, a effluent treatment plant, and it was milled and it was fused to high temperatures. And as you can see the stacked graph, the sludge, sludge is predominantly inorganic in nature and organic functional groups are absent. 
So from table two, you can see the ash content of that Excel sludge is more than 60%. As per co-processing guidelines of India, uh, the ash content should be more than 60% for any, any waste material to be used as an alternative raw material. And you can also see that if the sulfur content is less than 1%, if the sulfur content is less than 1%, the scale formation in the cement cleans can be avoided. So it was, it was also compared with the RM. RM is nothing but raw mill. The, uh, it was collected from the local cement industry, where, which is nothing but limestone and uh, other uh, clay, which is the raw material for cement manufacturing. So from table three, the bed, bed surface and surface area analysis was carried out. And you can see the surface area reduction from 16.88 to 0.1, which shows the agglomeration particle, uh, agglomeration property of the textile switch, that fusibility, uh, the ability to, to form clinker. This, this, these particles was conf uh, confirmed by BET and the same was confirmed using particle size distribution uh, analysis, which is available in figure three. So, ICP-MS analysis was carried out for textile sludge and it was compared with the raw mill. ICP-MS analysis is one of the highest accurate uh, analytical analysis for um, analyzing the elemental oxides uh, proposition. So you, you can clearly see the red highlighted. The textile sludge has high uh, calcium oxide and uh, enough silica, silica dioxide. But in, in case of Al2O3 and uh, iron oxide, the, the alumina and uh, iron, uh, iron ore are like less. So if it is recommended to use some bauxite and iron ores for the correction to use uh, Texas sludge as an alternative raw material. And upon fusion, you can increase the, uh, you can see the increase in concentration, but the actual concentration remains the same because of the loss and loss and ignition. So again, the evolved gas analysis was carried out using thermo, uh, thermoprimetric analysis hyphenated with the FTIR. And with respect to increase in temperature, the predominant gas evolved was CO2 and there were no uh, organic gases evolved during the reactions. Uh, and uh, that, that indicates the predominant inorganic nature of the textile sludge. And uh, uh, the, the core, uh, core heart of the work is kinetics. Kinetics is nothing but what is the best way to achieve the reaction? What is the minimum energy required to uh, start the reaction and sustain it? That is called activation energy. As you can see, for uh, textile sludge, the activation energy required uh, from the, uh, moving from the reactants to product is very less compared to the activation energy of the raw mill. So, the calcination kinetics was computed using uh, standard ASTM kinetic methods and international kinetic rules were uh, strictly followed during the experimental process. And the heating rate chosen uh, were the experiment is 10 degree, 15 degree, 20 degree. And this, uh, these were uh, on par with cement, uh, cement clean heating rate. As you can see for textile sludge and raw mill uh, in figure seven, the the B and D, the degradation zone, it is also of similar in nature. So, the, using this uh, uh, experimental data, we developed a multi-factor regression model using response surface methodology and the prediction accuracy of the regression equation uh, present below in the slide uh, was in the range of 0.96 and 0.90. And uh, uh, through through this, uh, we can develop some uh, optimization tool and find out what is the actual re required energy and heating rate required for the actual conversion of the product. So, XRD analysis was conducted uh, to identify the phase transmission and the, the uh, potential formation of the box compounds, that which are C2S, C3S, C3A and C3A4F. So the, these box compounds are responsible for cement-like uh, properties and textile sludge was exhibiting this compound, these properties at high temperature and it was compared with a hot mill at 950 degrees Celsius. And uh, through same analysis, the agglomeration property uh, was also confirm confirmed. So in, in, in case of response surface methodology, we got only 0.96 uh, accuracy so artificial intelligence machine learning model was developed using performance and transfer function 
of uh, mean square regression and transsigmoidal and it was uh, uh, regressively uh, optimized to get an optimum network and finally with a single multiple multiple perception layer and with the three neurons we were able to get achieve uh, accuracy of 0.99 the this, this in this case the input is material heating rate and temperature and the output was uh, massless the thermal degradation behavior and the prediction accuracy was very high and uh, this this this, this can uh, be very helpful in uh, re reducing the uh, experimental cost and by developing this uh, model inside the boundary condition you can pre predict the thermal degradation kinetics so this is my summary of the uh, work and as you can see the uh, texel sludge had a high sludge uh, high, high ash content and the volatile matter is 25 percent but the calorie value is less than 200 kilocalories that indicates that it, it has only alternative raw material property and no alternative fuel property and the sulfur content and the chlorine content was less than one percent which is also as per co-processing guidelines and uh, the thermal reactive act oxidation kinetics uh, said that the average activation energy required for textile stretch is 160 kilojoules and for raw mill it is 230 kilojoules and uh, as future scope of study LCA analysis is proposed to find out how much global warming potential it can reduce and these are the publications uh, my publications on different materials but the same methodology and the standards were adopted for uh, executing this work thank you Thank you, Satya, for your presentation. Um, and now we will be moving to the poster presentation followed by a Q&A session. In this session, the speakers have three minutes for introducing their key findings and results. Um, so our first presentation will be introduced by Hannah Corpus from Philippines, whose presentation title is Solid Waste Composition, Determination and Analysis at the University of Bantingas, main campus, Philippines, a baseline study. Hena is a student of bachelor's degree in civil engineering at the University of Bantingas in the Philippines. And we do not have Hena with us right now, so we will be playing a video that was sent to us. The most important element of waste management system is the waste composition study. With the growing population of the University of Batangas, solid waste also increases. This has adversely affect the gas of control of the university's authorized waste management staffs. This study aims to define and report the composition of the university's solid waste through selection and manual sorting of waste samples following the STM D5231-22 standard to generate conclusions and implications regarding the waste composition as determined by following the said standard, and provide recommendations for improvement of the solid waste management in the said university. Pre-start site assessment, in which the researcher assessed the staging where the collected solid waste were placed. Sampling shall be carried out at the staging with accordance to the international standard ASTM D5231-92. The determination of the mean composition of the solid waste was placed on the collection manual and sorting of a number of samples over a period covering a total of six days. As presented in the table, here is the complete list of material categories and their definitions. In a data and entry, we see the governing equation for the number of sorting samples and the suggested values of x and x bar and t. In the span of six days of sorting, here is the data that has been gathered. Therefore, we conclude that through following the STM D5231-92, we have been successful in highlighting the composition and characteristics of the solid waste in the university. The domain source of the dominant component, which is the food waste, was identified to be the institution's cafeteria. The main components of the waste are food waste, mixed paper, and plastic which comprises nearly 90% of the overall solid waste. As food waste being the dominant component, composting efforts could be extended without adaptation over a period covering a total of six days. As presented in the table, here is the complete list of material categories and their definitions. In a data and entry, we see the governing equation for the number of sorting samples 
and the suggested values of x and x bar and t. In the span of six days of sorting, here is the data that has been gathered. Therefore, we conclude that through following the STM D5231-92, we have been successful in highlighting the composition and characteristics of the solid waste in the university. The domain source of the dominant component, which is the food waste, was identified to be the institution's cafeteria. The main components of the waste are food waste, mixed paper, and plastic which comprises nearly 90% of the overall solid waste. As food waste being the dominant component, composting efforts could be extended with the adaptation of vermicomposting that could help in converting the compostable components into fertilizer. Thank you, Hannah, um, to be present here with us in spirit. Um, moving forward, um, I would like to remind you that you can still post your uh, questions in the question chat tab. Um, and now we have come to the last presentation of the session. Um, after this session, we will have a brief Q&A. So let's welcome our last presenter, Hania Jalalipur from Germany, whose presentation title is Rethinking and Recycling of Household Organic Waste, a study of Iran. Hania is PhD and postdoc researcher at the University of Rostock, Department of Waste and Resource Management. Hania, please, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you, Ashprit. A very good day to everyone. I start my presentation with the question, why do citizens play a key role in the transition toward the circular economy? The citizen chooses the base of the waste management value chain, what to buy, to what amount, how to consume, when and how to dispose of at the end of the life. The more effective the citizen involved, the longer the life cycle of the product, as well as the higher possibility of solid waste treatment in an environmentally friendly manner. Today, I share the experience of involving citizens in the management of household organic waste in a city with 1.6 million inhabitants in Iran. In a pilot project in 2020, the municipality designed a simple and cost-effective rotating composter out of plastic to distribute among the citizens. Though the pilots were visited regularly by trained personnel offering technical guidance, 20% of composter went out of service due to poor maintenance. At the same time, a local environmental influencer shares her life, her zero waste lifestyle on Instagram. She encourages citizens to adopt sustainable consumption choices. In a personal campaign, she instructed her followers to simply air dry the unavoidable organic fraction, making use of the semi-arid weather conditions. After one year of activity, the followers reached out to the municipality for collecting up to 300 per kilogram per month of dried organic waste. This trend raised the question about the most viable options. Therefore, we made a short video about implementing both methods at home and along with a survey link, it was distributed among citizens. The, in, the inquiry form included question and individual information and preferred choices. As you can see, the majority of participants, about 66%, attributed to women. 58% of participants were between 25 to 40 years old, with family sizes mostly between 2 to 4 people. Up to 82% were willing to implement one of the two methods, of which 65% choose air drying with, with a curbside collection of dried organics. Overall, citizens preferred air drying more as it requires less know-how, time, and space. Therefore, the municipality adopted air drying to engage more people and educating the people for home composting in the long term. Thank you, everyone. Ashprit, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hania, for your presentation. Um, so we have come to, to the end of our session one. 
Uh, we do have time for Q&A, so if you have any questions, please post it in the question tab. Thank you, Ashpreet. Thank you, Ashpreet. I think um, since we did not receive any questions, we can end this session. Thank you to all the speakers for participating at the conference with us. You did it very um, well, which makes the grading process difficult on us. And now we will have a five minutes break before we continue our conference with the second session which will be moderated by also our speaker, Hani Jalalaipur. We will see you again after the break at uh, in five minutes. Thank you all. See you soon. Thank you.
Welcome everyone. We're about to start the second session of the abstract competition. Please welcome Hani Jalalipur to the stage. We have already introduced you before in the previous session. Hani is a PhD and postdoc researcher at the University of Rostock in Germany at the Department of Waste and Resource Management. Hani, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Amani. Hello, everyone. My name is Haniye, and I'm delighted to be moderating this session. We are very lucky to be joined by six speakers. Four of them will give a full presentation, while two will give a poster presentation. Then we'll have a short Q&A session. Please remember to submit your question throughout the presentation through the question panel and include your name and state. We will be monitoring this throughout the session. So. Uh, we will now be hearing from Diwakar at Hikari from Nepal, whose presentation title is Establishing a Community-Driven Governance Through Nepal Waste Map Platform. Diwakar is an environment uh, scientist and he is currently leading the Nepal Waste Map Program. Diwakar, please, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, uh, I am Divakar Adhikari and I'm representing a non-profit organization called Clean Up Nepal, which is based here in Kathmandu. Uh, we submitted an abstract to ISWA on the topic establishing a community-driven governance system through Nepal West Map platform. And today I'm here with a short presentation to talk about it. Nepal West Map is an end product of the research study we did back in 2017. It was a part of community solution program and it was supported by Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs of the U.S. Department of State and it was implemented by IREX. We have been promoting this platform as solution to existing waste management problem here in Nepal. Since its inception, we have also been focusing on contextualizing and developing this digital system as community-driven governance system because communities and public are integral part of Nepal West Map architecture. Back in 2018, a pilot program was carried out in Ward 3, 5, and 32 of Kathmandu Metropolitan City. Some of the notable findings of uh, the study include private waste collection companies, also known as PSO, delivering waste pickup service to more than 70% of the household in the valley. The cost of the service is based on monthly subscription basis and the cost varies from building to building according to the type of the building. On the other hand, the metropolitan city do provide free services, but it is only limited to certain regions of the city. Only a few citizens in the city are aware of the consequences of unmanaged municipal waste, but there are not enough resources or infrastructures available in their locality because the service provider has not been able to persuade the other half of the public to uh, get into sustainable waste management practices such as waste segregation. The lack of access to data related to the operation and function of waste management system has made authorized entities to either work in isolation or uh, provide only need-based service without exchanging information or coordinating plans and solutions effectively. One of the examples can be considered as the waste management problem reaching its peak every monsoon here in Kathmandu Valley. Budget allocated in millions of rupees each year for waste management are invested in resources without proper plans and strategies. We realized the need for data and introduced digital waste management system designed particularly for municipalities called Nepal Waste Map to address all the issues related to waste management. Nepal West Map is a Clean Up Nepal initiative that was developed in partnership with the Asia Foundation and Development Initiative. This open data-based waste management and data mapping system consists of web-based dashboard and mobile application. This technological platform allows cities and municipalities to make robust analysis of waste-related data based on data available according to the components. Uh, it also helps to provide waste collection and management information of the waste companies or company working in that particular area. With the help of Nepal Waste Map mobile application, citizens can now report grievances related to waste to the concerned authorities. With uh, Nepal Waste Map, we aim to ensure that more and better data is 
available for informed decision making, planning and monitoring waste related interventions and development work. The mapping and data collected on waste related element contribute to visual and spatial understanding of existing functional and operational waste management system. With this transparency, each entity, whether local government, service provider or public can hold each other accountable for the issues and problem arising every time. We believe that this can ultimately lead to realization and segregation of specific role and responsibility among these entities. Hence, in the long run, Nepal Waste Map platform can be a tool that could help to mitigate or even solve uh, problems related to waste management. Nepal Waste Map architecture is based on five functional and operational components. After the five, the first component, Waste in Neighborhood, is designed mainly for public to have a medium to share grievances with the concerned authorities. It enables them to ha report haphazardly dumped or burned to waste, complain about irregular waste collection service, and learn about sustainable waste management practices. The rest of the four components are particularly for all stakeholders involved and with the data available, the platform allows them to undertake powerful analysis of waste-related data such as planning reforms, allocating resources, expanding the coverage area, monitoring and resolving the public issues and difficulties in real time. Nepal Waste Map platform has also been promoted as a communication and coordination platform. Uh, we believe that we should ensure that every stakeholder, be it single activist or multinational corporation working on the field of management should be on the same page in a particular area. Hence, apart from non-stakeholders in the project area, we try to involve other stakeholders working in the same field. For the data collection process, a workshop is done to train the enumerators to map all the waste related data in that area. The data collected on each component is geotagged. Technical enhancement does go side by side with data collection process uh, in order to ensure that there is no duplication of data to update and maintain the system regularly and uh, other technical stuff related to web dashboard management and mobile application management. With all the data available, a capacity development workshop is organized to train local government, uh, waste collection companies and public uh, on using the features of Nepal Waste Map platform. It includes familiarization training, hands-on session and follow-ups. Community training is usually organized uh, based on need and primarily focuses on sustainable waste management practices, waste segregation, and consequences of waste burning. We have narrowed down the type of users of Nepal Waste Map into three tiers, the public, waste management companies, and local government. Each of these tier has a level of access to use the platform, which actually is uh, the key roles and responsibility of these tiers that we are trying to make them recollect or realize. With the help of this platform, the public can and should report waste-related issues, access waste collection uh, information, receive uh, instruction and guideline, and participate in proper waste management. Uh, the service provider can and should be able to plan and implement reforms, strategically allocate resources, monitor and improve services, uh, share responsibility with other stakeholders working in the same area, and communicate with the public. Finally, the local government should be able to monitor uh, and uh, evaluate the services and uh, they can also be able to provide data-driven solutions, allocate contracts and set guidelines and coordinate with private sectors. Talking about the benefit apart from public being able to report the grievances, uh, in contrast to what service providers have been doing in the past, with the data available, the service provider can now be able to plan operations and smartly allocate the resources. Uh, collection point routes and schedules can be made available to the public and the service provider will also be able to plan and extend uh, collection routes and their coverage area. With the help of uh, the data available on the type of building, uh, the service provider will now be able to set and categorize collection fee and roughly estimate total revenue 
and set a waste management standard for their service area. Nepal Waste Map Platform also provides platform to small-scale organization working on waste management such as composting units and scrap dealers. The platform helps to connect these organizations with public or vice versa, helping them to sustain uh, themselves in their working area. Hence, Nepal Waste Map also helps to plan uh, collection and management of waste in a sustainable way. Uh, for further information, you can visit our website www.nepalwestmap.org or you can check out the mobile application by scanning the QR code. The mobile application is currently available on Google Play Store and if you need further information regarding Nepal West Map, then please contact us through the email given in the screen below. Thank you. Have a good day. Ladies and gentlemen, now you're hearing from Maris Matakangai from Philippines, whose presentation title is Mechanical Performance of Concreta with Spent Garnet as Partial Replacement to Sand. Maris is pursuing her bachelor's degree in civil engineering at the University of Batangas in the Philippines. Unfortunately, Maurice could not be part of the conference. However, we have a video where she presents to Good us day, everyone. her findings. I'm... So let's have uh, so let's leave the pros to the Maurice video, please. I'm Maurice Makatangay, and I will be the one to discuss our undergrad thesis entitled The Mechanical Performance of Concrete with Spent Garnet as Partial Replacement to Sand. But the question is. Why did we choose spent garnet as the main material to replace the conventional concrete mixture? With the increasing trend to replace the conventional concrete mixture. With the increasing trend in the prices of the building materials in developing countries, and with the view on contributing to global efforts and resource conservation and construction efficiency, this study is pursued to develop cementitious materials the building materials in developing countries and with a view on contributing to global efforts and resource conservation and construction efficiency, this study is pursued to develop cementitious materials using spent garnet as partial replacement to sand. Let me give you some of the qualities of our chosen material. First, it is suitable for wet or dry abrasive blasting. As you all know, Garnet is composed of natural almadine rock grains. Due to its hardness and angularity, it has been commonly used for sand blasting and water jet cutting. Second, it increases productivity. Third, it is recyclable up to five times, which means it... Good day everyone, I'm Maris Makatangay and I will be the one... ...sick and it does not draw moisture. Objectives the objective of this study is to evaluate the mechanical performance of ordinary Portland concrete incorporated with spent garnet as fine aggregate. Spent garnet was used as a substitute for sand in concrete specimens at a replacement rates of 10%, 30%, and 50%. This slide shows the framework and the step-by-step -step process of our study, from planning, making the cylindrical concrete samples of normal concrete, and concrete with spent garnet with, with different fractions concrete, up to its curing process to testing and analysis of its result. Showing the test result, let me give you some brief explanation of the different types of fractures for us to fully understand the result of the compression test of the samples. But first, what is a compressive strength? Compressive strength is the maximum compressive stress that under gradually applied load, a given solid material can sustain without fracture. The compression strength of concrete is a measure of the concrete's ability to resist loads which tends to compress it. It is measured by crushing cylindrical concrete specimen in a compression testing machine. So here are the typical types of concrete fractures from type 1 to type 6 that is formed due to the compressive strength test. Type 1C Conical, from the word itself, forms a cone on both ends. The difference from type 2, CP, cone and split, to type 1 is that it forms a cone only on one end and vertical cracks running through the other end. Type 3, CL, means columnar, has vertical cracking on both ends. Type 4, S, shear, has diagonal fracture with no cracking through ends. Type 5, SW, or shear wedge, has a side fracture on top or bottom end. 
And last, type 6, CS, cone and shear has a similarity to type 5, but the only difference is the fracture is pointed. This slide shows the tally of the types of fractures from all the samples that we have tested. The common types of fractures in all the 36 cylindrical concrete samples are conical, columnar, and shear wedge. And based on the table of tally, both type 3 and type 5 have the same number of samples that falls under the type of fractures. Graph 1 shows the average result of the compressive strength test of the 36 cylindrical concrete samples. The blue line or the normal concrete with no partial replacement has the highest compressive strength in its 7 days curing than all the other concrete with partial replacement of 10, 30, and 50% of spent garnet. The 0% partial replacement has a value of 996.67 PSI. On the 14th day curing, you may notice the rapid decrease in value of the normal concrete as well as the 10% partial replacement. There is also an increase in value in the 50% replacement, but the green line or the 30% fraction of partial replacement of spent garnet rise up with a value of 1,006.67 PSI. On the last day or the 20th day curing, all the concrete with different percentages increased in value of its compressive strength. But the 30% partial replacement of spent garnet was the only constant fraction that rises up from its 7th day up to its last day of curing with a value of 1,266.67 PSI of compressive strength. Here are the average data of the result of the compressive strength test of the 36 cylindrical concrete with different percentages at the given days of its concrete curing. Interpretation of the test result First, the compressive strength increases with the increase of garnet fraction from 10% up to 50%. Second, the 30% fraction of replacement has the highest compressive strength compared to the normal concrete. This means that the 30% partial replacement of spent garnet may be the ideal percentage that might replace the sand in producing concrete. Conclusion and Recommendation First, the test result of the samples doesn't reach the design strength of 3,000 PSI. Second, garnet concrete can potentially be used in situations where compressive strength is not a major requirement. And last, Spent garnet is a prospective candidate for sand replacement up to 30% in terms of environmental amiability, cost-effectiveness, and conservation of natural resources. Like I said on the previous slide, the optimum replacement level was found to be 30% in all curing ages. Though, it does not reach the design strength, but with the proper handling of the professionals in making the concrete, there is a big possibility in increasing its compressive strength. This study may not be perfect, but the spent garnet directly contributes to a sustainable development and it is a cost-effective way of producing concrete while enhancing its structural performance and preserving natural sand from further degradation. I would like to say thank you for giving us, the young individuals, the opportunity for sharing our studies. I hope I was able to share some knowledge to everyone. Thank you and good day. Thank you. Uh, so we will come back to our uh, first presenter. I would like to welcome um, Kartik Kapoor from India, uh, whose presentation title is Testing Methodology for Scoring and Implementing Circularity in the World Cities. Please, Kartik, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Kartik Kapoor. And I will be presenting my research work on measuring circularity at the city level. Uh, firstly, I'll set a context of uh, circularity at the city level. Uh, then I'll uh, discuss on the indicator for circularity and its uh, methodology. And lastly, we'll share the results of the test study using the indicator that we carried in the three cities, which are Nairobi, Rotterdam, and Santiago. Um, there are very low consensus on the definition of uh, circular economy. And uh, most of the time, uh, circular economy and circularity are taken as synonyms. Uh, uh, in fact, there are more than 114 definitions that exist on the, the topic of circular economy. Uh, in the figure that you see on the right, you shall see horizontally the general process of uh, technique disposal that happens uh, in the city. 
and at each level vertically you would see the upper r processes uh, like reuse refurbishment recycling recovery which are putting material back for the use uh, for the study we accept the definition which talks about regenerative system to minimize the use and uh, resource uh, and the leakage of resources particularly um and from it we can say or proposing a hypothesis that circularity is actually about system whereas circular economy is about the economic actors for example a reuse process is a system but however incentives or the environment because of which it happens falls under the topic of circular economy and our prime interest is measuring circularity in the study um research uh, stated uh, uh, like uh, so we started our research particularly with the literature review and they looked at all the possible indicators that we could find uh, which we could use to measure the circularity so on the right that you see are the qualifying criteria that we used so the first being being quantitative so our main idea was that the indicator should be taking some tangible factors into place and the other part was on the simplicity which is like the indicator should translate into a simplistic score that could be used for benchmarking or comparison between two cities so out of all indicators that we found uh the indicators which qualified this two indicators were taken to the next level and were evaluated on the other three criteria which is functionality at the city level so generally we see that indicators lose relevance uh, in practical application and it was very important that the data methodology for indicator must be defined and the interpretation of that must be clear uh the other being process oriented that the indicator should be focusing on the upper processes like reuse refurbishment and the third was being impact sensitive that it should be reflecting basically uh, the circularity the impacts of circularity and what are the basic basically environmental benefits that we could uh, capture from it so uh, based on this three indicator like three criteria there were certain indicators to whom we evaluated on the scale of low to high uh, but none indicator really qualified uh, uh, on the scale of high for all the three criteria that we were looking for the closest was uh, fourth from your left which is waste hierarchy index and the third from your right which is the zero waste index so uh, as no indicator uh, as no indicator qualified basically so uh, uh, there was uh, there was a need for some original work to be done here and uh, uh, before i share the concept of the indicator let me take you to the figure on the left uh, which is a simplistic representation of the circular flow that generally happens in a city uh, there is consumption use of material material and disposal that happens in the city and then there are upper processes which put back those materials back in the use stream again uh, be it in city economy or outside the city boundaries uh, each process basically is avoiding some emission uh, because the new consumption is avoided uh, but the process itself also has certain emissions uh, which is released uh so the indicator concept has basically two parts on the left we you would see is the ratio which signifies the material consumed from the circular process and on the right is the impact factor which accounts process emission in context to the avoided emission so like for process like reuse if there is no emission in that activity happening the impact factor will be one equation 1 and 2 is what to which indicator translates for selected representative products material feedback in the economy is being graded based on the emission uh, giving a score value uh, for the representative product which when cumulated uh, give us a final score of circularity which is in indicator emission and i would be explaining later um since uh, for the consumption part there is nothing which exists uh, that would be representing the city's consumption we have used uh, domestic material consumption as a proxy value here being uh, adjusted to the city level uh so talking about the methodology um, so the upper processes are divided into six cascades uh each cascade has some relevance to the circularity for example uh, the recycling cascade uh, is something where the, by reducing it, it basically reduces the consumption of a virgin material or a new material whereas a reuse cascade is something where the prolongation of the life happens and there is a reduced consumption so uh, uh, to just set a easy framework we divided it into six cascades and for representative material stream like the materials which are used to represent the circular economy of the, the circularity of the city uh, we map those processes in this cascade so for each process uh, map uh, then the data is collected which is about the material that the process handles and what are the emissions of the process uh, which are happening and then they are accounted in the indicator so uh, sharing with you the results that we found uh, by implementing this methodology and indicator in three cities between Nairobi Rotterdam and Santiago uh, firstly uh, uh, 
we selected batteries, accumulator batteries, and prefer carbon as a representative product. So for all these three cities, these products were our representative products, and we were, uh, whatever score we would be getting based on them would be compared in these three cities. Uh, so uh, what we found is that the recycling was the most active uh, process in all these uh, cities for batteries. And for uh, paper and cardboard, they were reused as like uh, secondhand trade of books, uh, which was one of the re uh, reused uh, map uh, process in the lines of opera, uh, and the uh, recycling being the other one. Uh, the most of the data uh, for this would was uh, collected by doing the field work, uh, interviewing the concerned authorities and the literature reviews, and especially for the impact factors, the benchmarks that uh, exist for EPA and for equipment, uh, those were being used here. Um, if I uh, uh, like, yeah, uh, here also on the screen, uh, like uh, the result table, you could see that uh, there were no uh, particularly reused process existing for batteries for lead acid and lithium ion batteries. Whereas for recycling, there were certain process, and uh, uh, based on this uh, data and using the indicator proposed, uh, we found the circularity score. And in addition to that, we also found the impact value, which is like how much total greenhouse gas emissions were avoided uh, due to the recycling and the reuse processes in the city. Uh, what we have found here is uh, that uh, Nairobi scored the highest and Santiago uh, scored the lowest. Um, the Santiago's uh, consumption, uh, the domestic material consumption value was very high. Um, it also follows a trend of a growing economy where there's a high consumption, but not many reuse or recycling process at least, and the waste management system is not much mature enough. Uh, and that's why uh, the score value is uh, very low. Uh, for Nairobi, what we see is uh, the consumption is definitely uh, low, given it's a low income economic city. Uh, but uh, also there is an optimum use of resources that happens here. And uh, following in Rotterdam, we see that, yeah, of course, it's a representation of a developing country, a city from a developing de uh, from a developed country. Uh, the consumption value is higher. But there are also a lot of other efforts that go over so recycling and circular process and that have kind of brought its score also a bit higher but a bit less than uh, Nairobi here. Um, here I'm also sharing a little snapshot on uh, what on the impact level we found uh, that for paper cardboard and for batteries uh, uh, we uh, looked at the recycling processes and found uh, and have, are showing the compare images below basically are showing the comparison uh, on uh, per kg per uh, kg per capita of greenhouse gas that is avoided annually due to the recycling process at least and uh, this uh, basically just validates the uh, uh, one thing that uh, circular economy has a great potential for basically reducing the greenhouse gas uh, uh, um, emissions also um, of course, uh, our major conclusion was that uh, recycling turns out to be the most prominent activity uh, and uh, we really need to push more circular activities in the city uh, in terms of upper our processes. Uh, Nairobi, which uh, scored higher, one reason accounted for that is also because uh, of the resource crunch. People prefer to buy the second-hand products, which kind of boosts, uh, boost, uh, like supports the circularity. So I think the behavior change uh, towards this taboo of not using the second-hand products or uh, there would be some problem uh, if we... Uh, uh, go for the uh, products which are coming to the higher, which are refurbished or uh, you know recycled. I think uh, that behavior change is also important. Uh, I would like to share certain limitations of this study. The first being that in our indicator, we use domestic material consumption as a denominator. Uh, this was itself by our limitation that you know we didn't find any consumption uh, representing value for the city scale, and that's why DMC was uh, uh, basically. Uh, uh, converted uh, at a city level and used as a value. However, there is always a scope that uh, we could uh, use this consumption value uh, focusing on the representative product also, or could find a new uh, 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 indicator for that, which could fit in the denominator here. The other is basically the benchmarks of the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so we, uh, the benchmarks that we use for uh, finding the impact factor were mostly focusing on the, the North American context. Uh, but this is also a global limitation where uh, the such data and uh, emission values don't exist for uh, low-income economies, especially for the global south. Uh, the third being the product basket. So for us, the product basket was limited to the accumulator, batteries, and paper and cardboard. But however, uh, there are possibilities where uh, there could be other products also which could be used to define, uh, used as a representative for circular uh, circularity in the city. Uh, and as a future work, I would say uh, it holds that we uh, definitely want to replicate this study uh, with different materials and different cities to see the, how the indicators are and uh, the benchmark produce, how comparable they are at the city level. 
I thank you so much, IPG, for this opportunity, and I do my presentation here. Thank you. Thank you, Katrick, for your presentation. A reminder to the audience to keep submitting your question for us to come back to you at the end of the session. And now let's uh, welcome our next presenter, S. Pradeep Kumar from India, whose presentation title is Studies on Bioleaching and Recovery of Metal from Printed Circuit Boards Using Theobalcillus novellus bacteria. Pradeep Kumar has a PhD and MTech degree in environmental engineering from Pondicherry Central University. Pradeep Kumar, please, the floor is yours. Good morning to everyone. I'm Dr. S. Pradeep Kumar. My uh, research topic is studies on biology and recovery of metals from printed circuit boards using Diabacillus novellus bacteria. Yeah, introduction. So as we know very well that waste is, nowadays, uh, we are not going to consider the waste as a uh, simply uh, dumping one. So we must have to recover the materials from that and we can use, reuse that and we can take it for the uh, next level of uh, uh, recycling market. In the recent years, um, uh, e-waste is one of the uh, very fastest growing waste stream all around the world. So uh, in, in recent decades in India, it has been produced nearly 1.7 million tons where nearly 23.5 percentage is only taken for the recycling purposes, comparatively, which is, which is very, very low. And another one is printed circuit boards. Printed circuit boards is a distinctive part of an electronic waste, all the electronic gadgets having that. So uh, when we dispose it off uh, improperly to the environment, it will definitely affect the uh, soil fertility and uh, uh, water. So that uh, we uh, we decided in our research work to recover the metals and uh, 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 inbounded in the printed circuit boards, uh, which really are uh, a cause for the environmental degradation. So here we have uh, chosen a methodology called as bioleaching, uh, uh, other than its counterpart, pyrometallurgy and hydrometallurgy having uh, many disadvantages. So we have decided to go for a bioleaching process. We are using here for a bacteria to recover the metals in the printed circuit boards to, uh, uh, to an, a proper uh, disposal. The objective of the study is to find the influence of various parameters such as pH, temperature, OR, P cell density, solid liquid ratio, and so on and to find the most desired bacteria and its ideal condition to recover the metal in a maximum state. Yeah, this is a material. We have the uh, uh, printed circuit board. We have purchased it from the local uh, marketplace. Yeah, this is an unshredded PCB. And the second image shows that the shredded PCBs. Yeah. Here, uh, uh, the rear side of a uh, PCB, which having a green color resign material over on that to protect the uh, 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 metals which are inbound on that. So we are removing that. Why it is so in the sense it is one of the inhibiting compound for the bacterial growth so that we are trying to remove that. And we are using uh, NaOH, one normal NaOH to remove the uh, uh, resign. When you are mixing this, a broken pieces of printed circuit boards in a NaOH, it will produce a lot amount of heat. So during that heat process, it will be removed from the board. You can see the uh, surface of that board, which having a copper metal, it's completely spread over on that. Yeah, it is a result of a metal analysis in MPCB. Uh, we have done through uh, ICP OE, uh, OES, inductive coupled to plasma optical engine spectrophotometer available in IID Madras. So you can see the result that copper is, is, is in the maximum range, nearly 255 
grams per kilogram of PCB. And zinc is in the next level, lead, nickel, and aluminum are the uh, respective uh, places in that. For this study, we have chosen five metals, copper, zinc, lead, nickel, and aluminum. This is a um, uh, cultured bacteria. So we have purchased it from NCL Pune National Chemical Laboratory, Thiobacillus novelis. This is a culturing medium, solution A and solution B, solution C and solution D. These are all the various mineral compounds which is used for the bacterial growth. This is a culturing procedure. So I'm not letting, uh, getting, get into the that. Yeah. yeah, this shows that asymptotically transferring the bacteria into a culturing medium in a, in a, a vertical uh, food. The, the, uh, the image shows that the bacterial medium after the growth of the bacteria, Thiobacillus novelis. Yeah, the second uh, next process is process for acclimatization. Uh, in my study, we have uh, three processes. One is a process on electronic waste, another one is a process on bacteria, and another one is a process on uh, acclimatization, and another one is a process on uh, biology study. In the third step, process on uh, acclimatization study is we are trying to adapt the bacteria for the uh, uh, printed circuit boards uh, medium here. Yeah, we have a 250 ml ml flask and uh, we are adding the culture, the bacteria to the electronic waste and we are monitoring the parameters, pH, ORP and cell count. The final result, what we are expecting in that is a more amount of growth, that is cell growth. Yeah, this is the fourth process, bioleaching batch study we have conducted in our laboratory. Yeah, this is a, a, a methodology for what we have adapted for our research work. So we have a four cases. One is pre-prepared plus unadapted cell plus no energy source. Case two is pre-prepared for an uh, uh, electronic waste. We are removing that resign. That is what I'm trying to say is pre-prepared. Adapted cell plus no energy sources. And case three is pre-prepared plus unadapted cell plus energy source. We are providing an energy source in that. And fourth process is pre-prepared adapted cell from the electronic waste and the plus energy source. The monitoring parameters are pH, temperature, relative humidity, cell count, ORP, and so on. The final result is metal leaching efficiency and its duration. Yeah, the same thing. Uh, here we are using and PCB dosages of five, gram, 10 gram, 15 gram, 20 gram, and 25 gram. But in NPPT, I have not shown all those things due to the limitations in the slide numbers so that I have restricted with five grams of an PC. Now there is, this is a results and discussion here, the influence of pH. You can see here uh, from the first day onwards, the pH of a solution is nearly from uh, 8 to uh, 8.5. So it is depending upon there is a slight increase in generally because the original pH of a culture medium is prevailing in from, from 8 or 8.2. But when you add an electronic waste to that, what happens means electronic waste is generally in alkaline nature so that it will uh, increase the pH value so that it will uh, move towards an 8.4 to 8.5 slightly. And after that, it starts to uh, uh, decreasing to its original level of an pH. So here from the third day onwards, it starts to stabilize and it starts to originally move towards its original pH level. And the various um, the graphs here representing that it is a five gram and it is for 10 gram and it is for 15 gram. Now this is a cell count. You can see here that at the initial stage, uh, it is nearly only two lakhs cell count and uh, days prolong, it starts to increase and it reaches at the ninth day, the peak of the uh, cell count where a large amount of an, uh, cell count is available and it starts to decrease. So it is for five gram of PCB and this diagram, second graph represents the 10 
uh, grams of an PCB. And here it is on 15 gram of PCB. And in a 10, 20 gram, you can see that there is no any uh, development of cell growth. So it, it generally exhibits that 20 gram represents that it is very toxic to the growth of that PCB so that it cannot able to further grow in that. So until 15, 5, 10 and 15 gram, you, you can have a cell growth here. This is a various uh, variations of metal leaching percentage during bio leaching of 5 gram of PCBs for various cases and the solid liquid ratios of 5 by 5 by 250 by T novelis. 5 is an PCB gram and 250 is the liquid that is available in a cultured media. Here you can see that copper, uh, this is a case one, copper, it shows a very uh, uh, minimum uh, uh, leaching efficiency as well in a second cases it is slightly higher and third and fourth one is shows a full uh, uh, leaching efficiency nearly 68 percentage. Why it is so in the sense we have conducted in a two types of a study that with the acidophilic bacteria and as well as with alkaline uh, alkaliphile bacteria. Now I'm presenting the alkaliphile bacteria, the original pH of an alkaliphile bacteria for a sustainability for a survivability is nearly 7.5 to 8, the pH of an culture medium. But as you know very well, the uh, pH goes down. That means the value of an pH goes down two to one, then the, the, the metal leaching efficiency can be easily able to done because of that highly acidic nature. But here we have tried that what happens in an alkaline medium, whether the originally pH of a culture medium contributing for the metal leaching or a bacteria which represents the uh, bio leaching. So we have found that bacteria can able to even leach out the metal in an alkaline medium. Here you can see that uh, zinc metal in case one and case two, case three and case four. Case four represents in general uh, uh, as a best uh, uh, solution because we have treated the waste uh, adapted bacteria and we are providing an energy source also so that it produces a, a higher results. For an, a lead also, so for lead, but it is the, the leaching efficiency seems to be very for different metals because of its sensitivity with the bacteria and its sensitivity with the reactive substances. Yeah, this is for aluminum, for all the five metals and for or all cases, but I have only presented the uh, five gram uh, about 250 results. This is the same analysis of PCB before biology. You can see the metals inbound on the PCB. So this is a plastic part of the other uh, PCBs. You can see that how uh, the bioleaching process, how the uh, bacteria have uh, uh, disintegrated the surface of the PCB through the same uh, uh, scanning electron microscope. Here you can see the hole. This hole is actually uh, inbounded previously with the metal and it has leached out by the bacteria. Yeah, there's an FTIR result which represents that uh, diabacillus novelis can produce uh, inorganic acids when it intakes the food as an energy source. So that inorganic acid will also can able to produce an bioleaching processes so that here the inorganic acid produced by this bacteria is sulfuric acid. Yeah, the salient highlights of and conclusions are here, the actual variation in PGH during the bioleaching period of anti novelis for various PCB dosages ranges from 8 to 9.1. The high alkaline level of PC, uh, pH may be attributed by the combined effect of the alkaline nature of the bacteria on the PCB. The stabilization of an pH is found to occur on the third day in the T novelis for various PCB doses, dosages. The maximum cell count attained for the alkaliphile bacteria, that is T novelis is 8.9 into 10 to the power of five. At the ninth day for case four, a fine solid liquid ratio of five or 20. And the variation maximum cell count with respect to PCB dosages. Yeah, the best results based on the metal aging efficiency for C4 and solid liquid ratio of five or 250 is we, are, we have ranked the metal uh, leaching uh, in, <coughs> in increasing order, lead, zinc, 
and aluminium are having a same equivalency and next to that is nickel and copper is in higher level for a tin ovalus. So among all the metals considered, the copper exhibits consistently insensitive so that it can be easily able to uh, leach out for that and the aluminium exhibits consistently marginal to higher sensitivity to the bacterial uh, bioleaching with respect to higher PCB dosages during the bioleaching process by T. nolos bacteria. It is all the various references. Thank you. The first presentation of the postal section will be introduced by Anbar Amin Hazem Said from Malaysia, whose presentation title is Malaysian Bio Waste Based Adsorbent Production, Life Cycle Assessment, and Economic Performance. Anbar is currently a research assistant at University Technology Petronas. Anbar, the, and the floor is yours, please. Uh, do you hear me now? Yes, we are hearing you. Okay, you hi everyone. Proceed. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Anwar. I came from one of the third world countries, which is Yemen. You know, Yemen is is considered one of the poorest countries due to the low knowledge and low education. People there, they really don't know how to deal with the solid waste. They just have an open area aside from each city and each village, and they just throw their rubbish and they and the waste there. As you know, this type of behavior has a long-term effects on their life and also has long-term effects on their land as well. Furthermore, our government has no regulation to supervise or prevent them from committing this type of behavior. And they also importing toxic chemicals such as heavy metals, pesticides and insecticides, which are really toxic and killing. They really don't know how toxic they are. For this reason, I choose my proposal and my measure, which is related related to this environmental issue. Where to the solution? Before, before doing sustainability assessment, we produce biocar using pyrolysis and optimize it using response surface methodology based on input parameters and also responses parameters. Then mixing and do the, and then do the surface modification, which is mixing iron oxide, which is magnetic, to make the product easily separated by external magnetic field and make it more recyclable. Then we apply it to the contaminate, uh, contaminated uh, remover. In order to make the product more sustainable, we test the sustainability assessment, as you can see from the right side. From the right side, we have the three types of sustainability assessment: techno-economical analysis. From the techno-economical analysis, we come up with the maximum profit. From the life cycle assessment, we come up with the minimum global warming potential. From the inherent safety analysis, we come up with the minimum here. After that, we do the mathematical modeling development. From the mathematical development, uh, mathematical modeling development, we select the multi criteria decision making. Then after that, we come up with the best optimum solution for the, our products. As you know, in order to achieve pillars of sustainability, we have to consider three types of aspects, the social aspects and also environmental aspects and also in economical aspects in order to achieve that. Uh, from finding one to know how excellent the product is, we optimize the product using response surface methodology based on biocar stability, improved functional groups and also enhance the removal efficiency of targeting contaminants. We also did the characterization analysis, such as XDS, FDR, XRD, and also others, in order to see how much improvement we got comparing to the raw by waste. From finding to the sustainability assessment result of comparing our magnetic biocar with the commercial products, our magnetic biocar products show a better performance in economy, indicating by higher profits. The lower capital investment costs and higher ceiling prices are also seen as a significant factors to lead to the higher profits. To sum up our presentation, since that we don't have much time, the value, the value added, from the value added to our products, we found out that our products can be easily separated and can be more recyclable comparing to commercial products. And this value 
goes to a circular bioeconomy of bio waste, which is a part of sustainable development goal. Uh, that's one. That's all for me, and thank you so much for listening and pay attention. Thank you very much, Anwar, for your informative presentation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will proceed to the next poster presentation. Please be reminded that after the presentation, we'll have a brief Q&A session. So uh, leave your question in the question box. Uh, let's welcome our uh, second poster presentation, Ashish Kanal from Nepal whose presentation title is Practices of Source Segregation of Household Solid Waste by Youth of Nepal. Ashish is currently pursuing his PhD under the Department of Energy and Environment from Terrier School of Advanced Studies in India. Ashish could not also be part of the conference. However, we have a video where he presents uh, to us his finding. So let's leave the floor to Ashish's video. Hello everyone, my name is Asis Kanal and I am from Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, I am also enrolled at PhD Scholar at the Department of Energy and Environment, Theory School of Advanced Studies, New Delhi. This study is combined conducted by myself, Suzagiri, and Prasuz Mainali. The study was uh, done to identify the practice of source segregation uh, of household solid waste among youths of Nepal. Uh, if you look at Nepal, Nepal is a small country located in uh, South Asia and between India and China. Um, it generates almost 14, 35 tons of municipal solid waste on daily basis. Uh, there is no proper uh, recovery. Waste recovery is very, very less in Nepal. This is the region, the maximum waste reaches to the landfill side. On the other hand, if you look the uh, act or the policy that is developed by the Nepal government, it, it says that the waste must be segregated in the household and the waste management company, they must collect the waste in the segregated form. So we did a study, uh, we did an online survey using the Google form. Almost 522 responded, they participated in this survey, which was conducted using the Facebook. Uh, we've, um, we got a, almost 56.5% of female respondents. Uh, most of them uh, means, uh, students uh, were there and below the age of 29 years old. Uh, by the data analysis showed that almost uh, half of the respondents, they have installed two dustbins in their kitchen for the proper source segregation. And 80% people have been segregating the waste in their households. Uh, people are more interested to segregate if they are provided with any form of incentives. But on the other hand, though people are, though 80% people are segregating the waste, 3.6 people only said that though we segregate the waste in our household, the waste collection service provider, they collect the waste in the mixed form. So we, we found a relationship between the uh, gender and the segregation practices. There was a proper relationship between the segregation and gender practice. Um, and if you look at the likelihood, the ratio significance, there are no association between the education and segregation practices. So based in, on the basis of this, we came to the conclusion that the segregation practice is very satisfactory among the youths of Nepal. The female are more interested uh, for the source segregation. There are no relationship between the education and segregation practices. Uh, apart from that, the incentive is very important for to change the habit, the behavior of the people so they can uh, more involved in the say, household source segregation of the waste. So if we do this, obviously it will lead to the least burden on the landfill side. Uh, based, based, based on our study, we can recommend that a study can be done to find out the greenhouse gas emission, which can be saved after proper source segregation is uh, conducted in Nepal. So these are four of the differences. So if we are, if you have any questions based on our presentation, please let us know. Thank you. Thank you for the listening. I would thank Ashish for being virtually part of our conference. Uh, I would, uh, I will apologize for the technical inconvenience you're experiencing uh, during this online conference. I would, uh, we will also try once more with Pradeep Kumar uh, to see if uh, his technical problem is got solved. Pradeep Kumar, can you unmute yourself and try to speak? Pradeep Kumar, can you hear me? Are you on stage?
Iwakar. Unfortunately, two of our speakers couldn't uh, present their work during uh, because of technical problem. So we will just wait a little while if one of them can proceed. Pradeep Kumar, I can see you online on stage. Yeah. Okay. Can you, can you able to hear me? Yeah, I can hear you clearly. Please proceed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I will continue where I stopped there. Yeah, so we have collected the electronic waste uh, that is uh, printed circuit ports from the local market for the study. So the first image shows the and PCB and the second image shows the shredded PCB on the front side. And that is the rear side of the PCB before the resigned removal. So this is the front side of the PCB after the resigned removal. Resigned removal have been done by using the NaOH, uh, one normal solution. We have uh, dipped the uh, broken PCBs into the NaOH solution. And the, uh, due to the high thermal evolve from the NaOH solution, so it has been, uh, the, the resign has been uh, removed from that. Why we have removed the resign in the sense, it is a very uh, inhibiting compound for the bacterial growth to recover the um, um, so we have a couple of plasma optical emission spectrophotometer. So you can see that copper is being very high in this and red, nickel, and aluminium. So for this study, we have taken five uh, elements. Means copper, and zinc, lead, nickel, and aluminum. So we have purchased various types of bacteria. We have identified bacteria. We have identified bacteria results and the methodologies. So we have purchased the bacteria from NCA Pune National uh, Chemical Laboratory Pune. So we have Structural mediums for the bacterial growth, various uh, nutrient substances, culture the bacteria. We apologize Just, uh, for the for the quality of the sound. Unfortunately, we apologize from you also, Kumar. We have to stop the uh, presentation. We'll try again with Diwakar. Thank you. Diwakar. Diwakar, can you hear me? Unmute yourself and talk. Thank you, Hanie. It was a very challenging session to manage, but it wouldn't have been an online event without technical problems. We apologize also for the two speakers, but we will try to have their videos and to be included in the recording of this conference. And thank you to all the speakers for participating at the conference with us. I would like to remind you that these presentations were part of a competition and will be selecting the three best presenters from the conference. The winners will receive a scholarship to the ISWA Swiss tw uh, Winter School in 2022 and a one-year ISWA membership and the mentorship from me and my colleague Dr. Navarro for submitting a scientific article in the Waste Management and Research Journal. We'll be announcing the winners on our website and we'll also be publishing all of the presenter's abstract in the conference book that will be available at the ISWA YPG conference website in the coming weeks. Please note that the recordings will be uploaded to the ISWA YouTube channel. We are now arriving at the end of day one, and day two will begin tomorrow at 2 p.m. Central European Summer Time. Organizing this conference by itself presents an innovation in cooperation with more than 10 committee members and more than 15 members of the scientific committee based in about 15 countries and working in different time zones. 
We delivered our best to create an enriching experience to you all. Everyone played an important role in making the conference happen. We feel lucky to have worked closely with you all. Thank you so much to everyone. Apologies for not being able to thank each and every person by name at this time, but I would like to extend my gratitude to all the organizing and scientific committee members. Without you, this event wouldn't have happened. We are also thankful to the ISWA Secretariat and ISWA event manager for supporting the ISWA YPG in every step of the organization of this conference. Special thanks extend to the honorary speakers, Mr. Carlos Silva Fijo, Dr. Arne Ragosing, and Professor Sahadat Hossein for accepting our invitation and for presenting themselves as inspiration models for the future of waste management. Thank you also for the former research team and leadership team of the YPG for having this idea to initiate this series of annual conferences and for building up success every year. Day two will begin with an address from our honorary chairs, ISWA President Carlos Silva Fijo and from Professor Sahadat Hussein. And we have a packed program with two technical sessions and a special session. Finally, don't forget to join us at the ISWA YPG and the Research and Innovation Working Group. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end of the first day of the fourth ISWA YPG online conference, the Past World 2030, the envisioned decade of changes toward the circular economy era. Are you a young professional ready for this challenge? On behalf of all the organizers and the committee members, I would like to express my utmost gratitude to all our wonderful speakers, presenters, and YPG members for making this event a success. And of course, a huge thank you to our audience who have joined us from all over the world. We hope you have enjoyed the sessions, found them informative and inspiring, and thank you very much for joining us and hope to see you back for day two. Thank you.